Corinthians uh, chapter 6. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, more or less chapter 6 and chapter 7 also is about nonlinear regression models. Um, and these topics are not easy. And I mean, multiple regression is not easy. So we're going very fast here. You should realize this. It's not uh, the idea that you want to learn everything about this subject in my, my three lectures from chapter 5, 6, and 7. So you should take this more as a, a first introduction to the topic. And then to realize sort of the, the to be religious, the power of regression models. So instead of being very detailed on, on multiple linear models, I want to go a little bit further and, and do some steps forward. And then uh, you want to need to work harder on this later on if you want to apply it for your thesis and your, your future work. But I want to show you what's uh, possible. So, so we're moving a little bit fast here. Um, so that means you shouldn't be too worried if not everything in this lecture and the next one uh, is very clear to you. But you should have an idea that this opened up some, some new possibilities. Right. So um, we started last week, or yeah, probably the week before, but mainly last week we worked on this linear multiple model. And it's linear because you have only <coughs> um, the first power of the variables. So there are no there are no products of variables, there are no fractions of variables, there are no no x squares and stuff. So linear means only first power of x variables. And we saw last week um, how we use this method of least squares to take data. So we have y, x1, x2, x3, and so on. And you have data on these variables. And then we can estimate the coefficients here, the betas. And we saw about uh, R square and this SE estimate for sigma and so on. So this is fairly nice and cool, but then um, of course you can work a lot with linear models, but ultimately if you do economics or any science basically, you're going to turn into fairly quickly also, you, you're going to turn into some models that are not linear. So they involve some, some different types of functions. And this uh, today's talk is about a few of the types of non-linearities that we can encounter and how we can deal with them. <coughs> and the cool thing is that it's actually going to, we're going to just do some type of trick and then we're going to return to rephrase the model in a linear way and use only the linear regression in SPSS <coughs> to estimate the coefficients. So that is why I said probably last time that this we start with a linear model and it seems like a heavy restriction, but it's not really that because we can use the linear model or the linear estimation also for non-linear models, as I will show you. So I give you a few examples of typical uh, non-linear models. And the first one is mm, something we're going to look at next week, but this is a very common <coughs> non-linear model in economics. It's called a, a demand model. 
So y is the demand, that means more or less the, the number of tickets that you sell, say, in a month period on some leg, from time Oslo. <coughs> then this will be depending on uh, several other variables. So for instance, the, the price of the service itself, that means the price of those tickets, which is a difficult concept because airline tickets are varying all the time, and, but let's assume there is a price, um, or there's an average price, or something like that. And then you have a, a price of some competing services that could be train, it could be the cost of using your own car, and so on. But let's say only the train tickets. And um, suppose R is some measure of the general income level. So these variables go, probably the income level in Norway has had a tendency to go up and up and up over the years, but it changes. So it affects probably the, the, the number of tickets that uh, customers can buy. Anyway, the economic theory dictates a model something like this. So it's a constant, and then there's a power of the first price, power of the second price, and some power of this income variable. So this is clearly not a linear function. And if you, if you ignore the two other factors there, if you look at only this one, So this is the most simple demand model where you don't have any competing services or competing prices. This function here, and in this case, this power will typically be negative. So the higher your own price is, the lower the number of tickets sold will be. And you have uh, some relation. Uh, looking typically like that. So every one of you who has done any economics have seen a curve like that. It's a demand price curve. Sometimes you had the price there and the demand there, but the curve is the same. So this is one thing, and we're going to look at that more or less next, next week. Um, the second one is just one example of what we call a polynomial model. And it's something like this. Suppose you have a, a commodity and you want to change, you want to try different prices. Then you would see sometimes that the profitability of your sales as a function of the price can be something like a second order polynomial like this. And if you look at exercise four four, there's a perfect example of such a situation. In that case, uh, the tickets for some um, uh, swimming pool or something in Molde, and the profitability becomes something like a second order po polynomial. So the idea is basically if you have a you have some fixed costs, so if your price is very low, you're going to lose money. And then hopefully, if this is any business at all, there's a break-even price on the low side. So you increase your prices, and people still will buy your product. And at some point, you start making money. But as you continue to raise your prices, people will lose their interest in your product along with some demand model and ultimately you might sell zero items at a very high price which is not profitable right so it goes something like that and you would be interested in trying to estimate this point basically where is where your maximum profit is So these are functional relationships, and they are no, no longer linear, right? And of course, if you observe, for instance, demand data, they won't look like this. So it's in one month you have this, this price, and I sell exactly this many tickets. No, no, it looks. The 
real world looks like this. If you change your price, you will see demand maybe like this. So it's not deterministic. It's a statistical relation, but it's also not linear. So what you want to do is you cannot really find the true exact demand function, but you can probably estimate it like based on something like this. And the same here. If you put your price, if you change your price here and you observe what you make of profit in a month, it won't look exactly like the economic textbook, but it will look maybe like this. And then you might want to estimate this kind of curve and use that to find the optimal point here. Okay. So these are sort of the classical nonlinear types that you have seen in your, your economics textbook and so on. And your mathematics course has taught you about the second order polynomial. You can differentiate, you can find the maximum and so on. But there's also a quite different type of what we call nonlinearity, which is um, uh, related to categorical data, more or less. <coughs> And so if you look at this, uh, this data with the selling prices of flats, we have some y are the prices, and then x1 is the area. So blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And you can make a nice linear relationship between those two. Then we have some other variables here. But in here somewhere, there's a variable called town. Um, And this variable is, is purely a nominal categorical variable, right? So it has just three towns. And for some reason, it was encoded, encoded one and two and three. But it would be fairly optimistic to assume that the prices should depend linearly on this kind of encoding, right? So if you just put one here and you put two here and you put three here for and you put the prices here, you look at just the average prices, you might have some level here and you might have another level here. But if you say that this is linear, then it should be the same difference up here. And of course, since one, two, and three has no numerical meaning here. It's just a number of, I mean, it's just a code. There's absolutely no reason why it should look like this. So you can expect a difference per perhaps between uh, Mold and Christian Sun. And then to all the Sun, there should be no relationship really between these. So it could be anywhere here. And in fact, you realize that this encoding is completely arbitrary. So it could equally well have been A. So the numerical aspect is completely gone here. And still, we will see that the sort of regression analysis, the whole regression model, should somehow uh, be able to take this three groups or these three towns into account in some, reas in some reasonable way. So the question is, how do we do this? So the, the, my main first statement is we cannot put this variable as it is into the regression model and hope for anything meaningful. So then what do we do? I will tell you in an hour or so. Yeah. 
so um, we are going to look at the type 2 and the type 3 nonlinears today. So the polynomial and this kind of thing, plus this categorical data thing. And that's going to be enough for one day. And then we deal with the, the first uh, issue. Uh, this kind of power model, as we call it, we'll deal with that next week. So, and this, uh, if we start with the type 2, which we call. We can call it polynomial type nonlinearity. I will show you that it's in, in fact more general than polynomial, but let's just call it that. <coughs> okay, so here you have a kind of a regression model, but it says that the, the dependent variable it depends on some p variable here, not only in with a linear term, but also with a nonlinear term, the square here. So, you know, depending on the sign of the second, the beta 2 there, a polynomial function would look something like this, with a positive beta 2 and a negative beta 2. But it's nonlinear, that's the point. So our linear regression doesn't work in the first place. Uh, we have data, typically for y, and then for the p. So it could be demand and prices, for instance. So here it says uh, 52, and here it says 15, here it says 64, 12, and so on. So just numbers. But you cannot put those two columns or t those two variables into SPSS and ask for a linear regression. Um, there, is a, there is in SPSS some uh, particular functions for exactly a, a second order polynomial and some simple stuff like that. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is very way, more, way more general. I'm going to show you a method that makes any type of this Nonlinearity possible to resolve. So the trick is very simple. It's almost so simple that it's difficult to see, maybe. And that's where really magic happens, maybe. When you cannot see what's happening. Um, The reason why this first function is nonlinear in a way is because it's the same variable here. So it's p here, and then it's p squared here. But suppose we just consider p as one variable, and then p squared as a different variable. They are, of course, related, and they are somewhat correlated. But they are different. So as I'm using SPSS, I can actually compute p square here. I can go to the, the computation or what is called the, the calculation thing in SPSS. And I can compute the square of this variable. So the square of 15 is 256, I think. The square of 12 is 196. 144. OK, they turned it down in recent years. It used to be 196 when I was in school. So <laughs> inflation, um, and so on, just to make it simple. OK, so and call this x1, call this x2, and rewrite the equation now. It says y equals to beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus e. And that's a linear model. 
So I can use linear regression in SPSS to estimate these three parameters if I allow myself to increase the number of variables. Right. So I, instead of having one variable p and a nonlinear model, I extend to having two variables, and then I get a linear model again. Whatever. So I'm going to show you that you can have any kind of function of um, of p, say here, right? So I hope you sort of appreciate this because what you have originally is just the data on y and p. And you really want to estimate this polynomial function here. And if you plot your data, it would look just perhaps something like this. And I want this curve here. This is the analog of the regression line that we used to have when it was linear. So this is the analog of the best fitting line, but it's now a best fitting polynomial curve, right? And how do we estimate it? Well, we talk SPSS into computing a new variable, which is the square of p, and then run linear regression with this model, and we get the three estimates, and it corresponds perfectly to this curve here. So um, and if you start thinking about this, you see that this can be done to any kind of uh, crazy nonlinear function and also involving originally several x variables. Let's see. So I can have like y and then three variables, and I can have nonlinear terms of the square of x1, or, well, here's an x4, so I need another one. But the product of x2 and x4 to the square. Or I could have the ratio between x3 and x2 as a variable in my nonlinear model. But any of these constructions here are possible to compute from what I have already, right? So if I have the data for x1, x2, x3, x4, I can also make data for x1 square here. I can make for x2 times x4 square and for x3 over x2 here. Now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven variables, and I can run a linear regression if I like. And if you're mathematically inclined, you see that you can even do this if you had something like um, you. Some of you are engineers, so you know the cosine. Suppose you have the cosine function of the x1 plus x2. That's very nonlinear, but you can compute it. So this is possible to compute as a new variable. So if your model happens to involve this, as it might do in physics or engineering, you are still able to estimate the, the model. Right. For those of you who don't know what this means, it doesn't matter. <laughs> You probably all know that the cosine function is something like this. But, uh, yeah. Okay. 
So just note uh, that since why I'm not talking about example one today is because this example one can in fact not be handled in this way. This is a kind of a non-linearity which is more evil, you might say, because the parameters are in the, the power here. So typically I would have data for y and my own price and the competing price and the income level. And then if I were to try to follow this uh, trick, I would try to compute P1 to A1. But A1 is an unknown parameter in the model. A1 is actually what I want to estimate. Huh? <laughs> I see some. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> so <laughs> here in uh, the first model here, I have the coefficients, they are sort of the, the, the factors before any nonlinear term here, right? But there's no nonlinearity in, or there's no unknown thing in this term. So I, I know I'm going to have a square here. So I can compute the p square variable. And then it's linear in the new variables. But here, Well, there's no way of doing this uh, with this method. You just got to trust me about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to put up a nasty word, which also the en engineers know, logarithms, to resolve this one. And we have to wait a week for such a nasty word. So we'll do that next week. So I'm just doing some examples with this uh, idea, and you, you, you will realize that it's, uh, it's going to work on most of the type of nonlinear function that you can write in this, this fashion here. So here is one. It starts nicely. It's a constant. Then it's a beta 1 times a variable. So this is a linear term. But then comes a product of two variables. That's a nonlinear term. So it's a f some factor or some coefficient times this. And then there's another horrible thing. It's a fraction x2 over x3. So it's not linear either. But I realized that these two pieces, they appear linearly in the model. So if I just put a new name on this guy and this guy, I'm linear again. So I define something I can call whatever I want. For instance, set1 is the product of these two. It's going to be a new variable. And set2 is the fraction of these two. I can compute that if I have data for x1, x2, and x3. And then if I rewrite my model, it's now a linear model. Again. Then I put the new things into SPSS, and I get estimates for my coefficients, but the coefficients are, of course, the same as appears here. So in that way, I can estimate the coefficients of a nonlinear model by linear regression. And that's quite almost surprising. And it's surprisingly simple once you understand this here. But <coughs> it works. OK, so I'm going to just, just to show you the, the going of this in SPSS. I'm going to do a simple one with a little. OK, so this is something I got from a textbook somewhere in a different setting. But there is a proposed model where you say that the These are sort of depressing variables, you know, but uh, G 
child mortality rate and the, the x is GDP per capita and some researcher they propose that there is some kind of relationship between these variables and it's supposed to look like what you call a reciproc reciprocal model so it's like this and then plus some random term so it means basically how does 1 over x how does this function look it looks like this and if you take beta 0 plus some beta 1 times 1 over x this function itself it should look something like Supposing both of co coefficients are positive, it should take this function and then just lift it by beta zero, so you get some lower level here, and x is here, and then, well, the beta one just does something to push this curve up and down along this, but there's a, l there's a kind of a floor here of beta zero where you cannot come below it. And as x goes to infinity, 1 over x goes to 0, so beta 1, 1 over x goes to 0, and this curve sort of comes down to beta 0. Yeah, so it looks something like that. So let's see, just since we have this uh, demographic data, let's just see how this looks. So what we have is actually not 1 over x, but we have is child mortality rate for some 109 countries and also this GDP per capita. So let's try and estimate these coefficients here with SPSS. And there's just a few steps. Okay. So first thing I want to do if I should do this is to check of course how does I want to plot y against x because the relationships should look something like this and then with a lot of deviations for countries. But if this model is meaningful, it should have, wow, have this structure, right? Okay. So we have uh, these variables here and you, you want to start probably with a graph. And the scatter plot, simple one, and put um, uh, x is what's supposed to be the GDP per capita, and the other one was supposed to be the child mortality. Right. And now, f uh, SPS is. Uh, things about it. I don't know why SPSS needs a lot of time to produce a scatter plot, but it seems to do. So I can clean the blackboard while we're waiting. It's ready now. So there you have this uh, relationship uh, with x on the GDP over here and the baby mortality over here. So although the data are not perfect and so on, um, you very clearly see this structure here. So it might might make sense to to estimate like this. So then we need to transform, we need to compute new variable. 
variable. Um, let's call it set equals to 1 over x. And then run linear. OK, that's set 2. So we estimate parameters for this relationship. And that's fairly easy, actually. If I can just remember my SPSS, it's compute variable. So I'm going to take 1 divided by the GDP per capita, and I'm going to call it something. So mm -hmm. GDP inverse, for instance. And the numeric expression is just going to be 1 over the GDP, which is X, yes. OK? Uh, so it's probably in the way right of my data set. And you see that this set variable, it op operates on a very small scale. So it's I'm going to have to beef up the decimals a little bit to see it. Yeah. But it's down here, if you like, you could, of course, multiply by 1,000 or something and then divide the resulting coefficient estimate by 1,000, if you like. But it doesn't matter for SPSs. So you would just get 435 instead of 0 0.00435 and so on. It doesn't matter. Um, so, well, I'm going to take my chance and plot. If you know plot y against set, I would ideally see something that is fairly linear and nice. And I can tell you that the picture isn't that nice here, actually. but. Um, at least I'm going to illustrate the idea. So, so ideally, the idea is that if this relationship is fairly correct with fairly equal errors and stuff, I would see a nice linear scatter plot here. Well, we see this. So. It's not perfect for linear regression, as you see. It's kind of, it has this problem that the error margins increases up here, and it also seems to have something more nonlinear. But still, we can estimate this linear thing anyway um, and see what we get. So the idea is then just after you compute your new set variable, you run uh, regression linear. And the dependent is um, this baby mortality, and the independent, the, my right hand side variable, the set, is this one. And OK. And then you get these uh, coefficients right here. So maybe. Uh, it would be better if you multiplied by 1,000, then you would probably get 20.5 here. It would be easier to interpret. But um, This is just the way that they would do it if they wanted to estimate coefficients in such a model. And then probably someone would say, OK, but the this model does, I mean, it doesn't look really linear, so you sh probably should work more on your data. But then you need to take more statistics. OK. So I'm not going to go in details to tell you the future or the, the next steps we would do here. But you see the idea? How we estimate in this kind of model. So it's easy. It's technically easy. OK. Um, So 
here are the coefficients, and the r square for that regression is about 0 0.60, something like that. OK, so that's more or less what I want to say about the, non, the polynomial type nonlinearity. So I call this also polynomial type. It's where you can compute from your existing variables also the nonlinear terms. And then you estimate by regression like this. So just before taking the break, let's briefly um, Look at this other type of nonlinearity. It's a categorical regression. And then I'm going to look at this uh, house data that you see all the time. I'm using this flat uh, the price data all the time because it's quite transparent and it it sort of has the interesting um, aspects that we want to illustrate with regression, especially this categorical type of variable. So if you look at the data here, I have it here, and I think we have seen this picture, but um, so we, we have seen that the, the area and the price are strongly related. And we see a scatter plot like this, something. But then what happens if we try to look at the points also distinguishing between which town we're in? So what's going to be the picture? Um, and it's fairly easy to make with SPSS. You make a um, scatter plot and take this with some colors. And area goes down here, and the price goes over here. And the color, I can make color on the dots by some other variable, which should then typically be, be categorical. So I'm going to put the town variable here. And just see what happens. Um, so it's a little bit uh, dim here, but you see uh, the blue are Molde, the green are Kristiansund, and the almost invisible are <laughs> Oldesund. So everything you don't see is from Oldesund here. Uh, you see them dimly in the top here, some Oldesund stuff, and then the blue ones are Molde, but the, at least Molde and Kristiansund you see a tendency that there is, it's almost the same slope, it seems, but a different level somehow. And it should be possible to, if you select all these dots, and you go to fit line at subgroups, uh, linear here. Don't attach a label to the line, but make the lines a little bit fatter, fatter than that. Close. Oh, I should. Oh, well, the labels should have gone. Let's see. Yeah. Close and close. Close, close, there. You see the picture that these are actually the regression lines fitted for the green one is for only the flats in Kristiansund. So I'm estimating the relationship between floor space area and price, but only for the green data. And the blue, only for the blue data. And especially between Molde and Kristiansund, it seems to be an almost fixed price level difference. And all the Sun is not much different from Molde. It's slightly steeper, but at least it has the same level distance from Kristiansund. 
So it suggests somehow that you know, there are some kind of price level in, uh, uh, I think, model days one, general level, if you call it. And then Christian Sun is down here, somewhat lower. And then all the Sun is around model day gain somehow. And the question is, how can we uh, do the regression here simultaneously with estimating this shift in, in levels? And that's not possible with anything that we have sort of done as far as this. So let's look at that after the break. And then I'll do my logistics trick here.